Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, show we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, I have some, I have a surprise in store for myself today, actually. Uh, I was pretty excited last time we were programming, oh, looks like we didn't sub start a drive, I must have rebooted. Um, I'm pretty excited because we actually got the lighting looking kind of cool and it's not even done yet, so basically like the... The kind of look started to seem pretty cool. Like I kind of liked what this was looking like. Like all the little, ref like the wall reflections look really cool. And it's surprisingly real feeling. Like it's got all kinds of nice stuff happening there. So I was pretty excited about this, but this isn't even really the lighting yet because this is not using the diffuse map at all um, during secondary bounces. So it's only using a specular version. Whereas what it should be using is it should be using the diffuse version. We just don't have that stuff set up yet. Uh, so we don't have a way to feed that in. And so we don't end up getting the uh, any use of the diffuse in here. So the lighting is actually not at all, it, it's not even remotely as good as it should be because it should be using a diffuse map for bounce computations during the uh, like convection pass. And it's not. So that's what we want to do today, and hopefully if I can get that working in, you know, in the next hour or two, uh, then today we will get to see what the lighting actually looks like for the first time using this scheme, uh, which I'm kind of excited just to see, because I don't know what it's going to look like, right? We're just, we're trying to put in a good lighting solution, but like anything else, if you're trying from scratch and you don't really have anything to go on, you don't really know how good the lighting's going to be or isn't going to be, right? Um... And so that's what we're looking at today, uh, trying to get that working. And again, like you can see, when I'm up here, for example, you can see that I don't get a much light transmission uh, down in there and so on. And when I'm standing, you know, it's a pretty narrow light field. Like you can see how little light uh, there actually is. And again, that's because this bounce lighting is specular bounce lighting, right? It's just not... It's not correct. So we want to use this map, which is the diffuse map. We want to use that for our bounce lighting, and that'll push a lot more light through the scene. It's how light would actually be behaving pretty much all the time anyway, because most surfaces are not mirrors, right? Whereas what we're doing right now basically simulates it as if they were all mirrors, more or less, right? And so what we're seeing is more like a mirror version of the world, whereas what we want to see is what's if everything was more of a chalky, like, you know, diffuse, soft sur uh, lighting surface. And so we kind of want to make sure we get that, right? We want to get that feel. So that's what we need to do now. Um, let's go ahead and, and take a look. I'm going to go ahead in here to the lighting code. And uh, the, the main problem that we're going to have is just that we don't actually have a the same format for, you know, one of them's in the, the format that the GPU is going to pick up, which is just a big texture atlas. The other one is a voxel, the one that we were, like an actual voxel. So, you know, you can see here, if I go into the code, uh, these light voxel cells are what we've been using to do the, the light lookups in here. And I think what we probably want to do is, because we know that we're basically GPU lighting, and we're doing some of it on the CPU, and we may want to keep doing some of it on the CPU, um, or we may want to move it to the GPU. I don't know which one we want to do. That's kind of an open question. But either way, regardless of that, the main thing that we are going to hit here is the fact that we know we at least want to be GPU through-lined, because uh, we know it computes the lighting at the end, and we know we need to put the diffuse map into the format it's going to use. So I think what we more or less want to do here is keep ourselves more or less on the GPU path the entire time. And if we happen to keep doing things on the CPU, that's fine. But we probably want to keep our data formatted in the GPU style as well as we go through it. Uh, and so I think I want us to start by taking the light voxel cells and stop. I want to stop using those, right? So rather than treating things as light voxel cells pretty much ever, um, I would like to treat these uh, as, um, I would like to treat the light voxel cells as an actual texture atlas, so that we're just a texture atlas the entire time. That's what I would like. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the plan. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just make the smallest change I can to produce that result. 
And if we look at what's going on here, so you can see we've got in, inside this, we've got the light voxel cells system here. And you can see that like how we've got that is it's basically a light, large voxel dim cube worth of these little you know, texture pieces, right? And what I want to do is convert that to an atlas. So in place of this, I sort of want like a light texture atlas thing. And at this point, since we know this is moving through the system quite a bit, and in fact, you can even see it, like if you look inside, um, like if you look inside the, where the commands, the game render commands are, where we're pushing this down, you can see like we've got this stuff here and we got the light voxel dim and the light voxel C and the light voxel D and all this, this garbage in there, right? Um, we sort of have this concept now of a light voxel atlas and we may want to just have that be a like we may want that to just be part of the system like we might want to know what a light voxel atlas is right uh and we might want to just have that be something that people understand so i'm thinking that we want something like this you know what i mean where we can just pass around one of these light atlases and instead of having all of these uh, constants and stuff, we can just make something where we know uh, for any given thing, if you just hand someone a pointer to a light atlas, they can get the information out of the light atlas that they need to do their work properly. Right? And so rather than just having it be scattershot, which is like uh, the reason I did it scattershot for now, so they didn't know what we needed. Now that I kind of see what we needed, um, I think that might be what we want. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is as far as I can tell, and it's it, again, it's a little bit tricky, so I don't really know. But as far as I can tell, like when looking at this system, I think that because we're big blocky cubes, I don't think we're actually going to need the depth system probably at all. Like, looking at it, I think, like, depth is just not necessary. It seems like we can probably get away with just using the lighting as is and not actually doing anything else, right? Um, the reason you would use a depth buffer, and we had it in there as, like, something to maintain and that we should, you know, keep in, uh, track of going forward, the reason for that is just because, look, we when we're actually doing lighting per pixel, maybe we want to check to see whether or not you can actually, from this location, wherever we're doing our lighting from, we may want to see, like, could we have reached this light source from here or not, or things like that, right? So I believe that that was the main, uh, the main reason for using the, the depth information in here. And I don't know that we're ever going to actually want to use that. So, you know, maybe we keep it in there, but I'm just thinking we probably won't. So I think I'll leave it, you know, because we're going to generalize the light atlas out a little bit, you know, maybe I leave it in there, but on the whole, I'm not really sure I actually want it. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty unclear about this, right? It may be that we just don't ever want this thing uh, in there at all. And it's, I, I, right, like, I don't know. Now, there is something that's kind of unfortunate, um, which is just that there's not a lot of ways that I know of that for light atlases to keep them like swizzled, which is probably what I would want to do here. And just to explain what I mean by that. So when we're loading in and distributing light atlases and stuff like that, I would like to be able to work with the light atlases a little more cleanly and eventually, if we convert the light atlases to like 8-bit or 16-bit rather than 30-bit, 2-bits per channel, which we almost certainly want to do, like at the very least, I would think 16 bits per channel for the lighting would be more than enough. Um, it would be nice to basically be able to pack these things in a little more densely, right? And you'd probably want to pack them in a pattern that would make more sense than just rows. I don't know. I mean, maybe not. And one of the problems is like OpenGL like texture submission without extensions is pretty bad. Like you're always sending down things and like unswizzled. They're just in a row, which is like the least likely way you are to access things in 3D graphics, right? 
you know, back in the day when you were just talking about displaying an image directly to the screen and you were scanning out the screen in rows and stuff like that, then storing images in rows maybe makes some sense. Nowadays, storing images in rows makes almost no sense whatsoever. You typically want to store them at least in blocks that have a like dimension. So like eight by eight blocks or something like this or four by four blocks. But of course, that's not really possible when you're just talking about straight OpenGL submission. Um, straight open gel submission doesn't support any kind of swizzling, so you have to have it in rows, and so that's kind of annoying. There are, like, extensions and stuff like this, but it's a problem everywhere. Like, basically, unless you're on a console, it's actually pretty hard to have any idea what the heck the swizzle pattern is going to be for optimal submission to a graphics card. And this is just because they use different memory, um, it's, it's a long story. On NVIDIA, it's easy because NVIDIA actually, I think, supports, uh, arbitrary, uh, memory bus swizzles. So I think on NVIDIA, you can pretty much just submit any swizzle format that's sane and they can handle it. On AMD, I want to say they don't do that. So uh, because AMD cards are less expensive, I think they, they use cheaper, me they just use whatever one like memory bus uh, wiring pattern. This is my understanding. And so like on AMD, you kind of need to know, like you need to query if you were going to like support a the swizzle pattern of the card, you have to say like, hey, what swizzle pattern do you actually use? And that can be pretty tough, right? Because then you'd have to have like sort of a JIT compile system that like, you know, compiles the graphics at that time to make sure you use the right swizzle. It's, it's tough, right? So on consoles, this is really easy because on consoles, you know the exact pattern that that hardware was designed for and you can just go ahead and like do all your programming to exactly that format and then everything's great. You can even store all your textures in that format and load them and not have to go through a swizzle. So you can see why like this is a huge issue, right? Anyway, long story short, I think we're going to have to stick with rows for now because I don't want to get into that whole territory because it's a really big can of worms. But I just thought I'd bring it up because it's worth understanding like what's going on there, right? So let's go ahead and start with the Light Atlas. And I'm just going to say here that, all right, let's, b before we try to do any performance analysis, I'm just going to say, let's make this say that we actually have like the, at, like the, the voxel dim goes in here. Uh, and then the, like the actual like uh, core dim, like, so the, the dimensions of the, and it looks like we only have an S for V3s at the moment. So I'll use that. And then the, like the actual little light templates, the little light squares, um, those are also need to have dimensions. Now we don't, I think really I'm trying to think if we ever want to make those things be different size. I don't know if we do or not. I will, I guess for now. So if we, if we want to make sure that those can be different sizes, I need two dimensions for those squares. I'm not sure what to call those, but I guess I'll call those like, um, uh, tile dim because it's like they're little tiles inside the atlas right so we know we have this layout of the voxel and this layout of the tiles and then we know we just have like a pointer right to the actual texels so I just want this to flow around so that when you get one of these you know that you can pull the information that you need out of it like here uh, and off you would go at the moment these are going to be f32s but I want to convert these to something else eventually as well. So I'm going to use a U8 pointer here. And the reason for that is just to make sure that the dimensions actually kind of flow through here. Now I'm not going to support arbitrary formats. We're going to fix the particular format. At the moment it could be F32, but it might be something else later. And so this right here, uh, yeah, might change. Now, you know what I could do too? Uh, I could do something like this. So maybe we define a switch here, like So maybe while I'm doing this, we just prepare for the ability because I would like to be able to uh, swap these, right? So we're just going to put this in here and we're going to say that Game Light Atlas is just a thing now that you can have in the game. And I'm going to convert the two things that get passed through to a game light atlas. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and, and try and fix up the code to make that work in, you know, a little bit in, in waves, right? 
So, and, and this right here would change to being like, okay, this is the light voxel diffuse. And then I could, I, mean, I could also have the light voxel specular come down here if we want to, um, because we can also provide the specular uh, for what that's worth. I'm not 100% sure how we would want to do that, but I think I kind of know. I mean, I think it's just, we just pass down the map before we do the blur, before we do the um, filter on it. And that should give you sort of an approximate glossy specular. And so we may want to put that, uh, to add that to the system and filter that uh, during lighting to give a specular highlight to things um, that are supposed to be shiny. And at the moment, we don't have a specular map. Like, we don't have a thing that tells us how shiny anything is supposed to be. But we could add that pretty easily. And that way, if someone's making a piece of art and they want a, you know, a little bit of it to, to appear shinier, like there's a bit of metal on it or something like that, then we could maybe use uh, that feature. So we may want to enable that. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, so what I'd like to do first is just do that conversion. So I'm going to say, like, well, we'll have the game uh, atlas in here. I don't know if we really want this light voxel D in there. So I'm just going to say, like, maybe that's not there anymore. Um, and so we'll just kind of have the light voxel C. So we'll have a uh, light voxel C here. Uh, and that's going to be that, that light atlas. I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm just going to sort of handle uh, all of the errors that I end up with, right? And there's going to be a lot of them. So here where we do the light voxel dim, none of this stuff happens anymore. So I think we're just going to call this like uh, diffuse light atlas like that. And in the OpenGL system, we're going to initialize that thing. So in here where we previously had sort of a bunch of random crap hanging around, um, I'm going to change that to being specifically uh, the, the, the buffer for this light voxel, right? So this is going to be light voxel C here. Uh, and, oops, sorry, light, game light atlas. This is going to be the light voxel C, uh, and, well, actually, you know what, this, now that I think about it, um, I should probably just rename these. Like, these should just be named diffuse light atlas everywhere, and where's the, uh, Where's the game render commands I was just on? There we go. I think that's maybe a little bit more sane. All right. Uh, so in here where we're working with these, now you can kind of see like, well, this is just getting pulled out of the light Vox commands. That's actually fine. Um, and the main problem that we're going to have here is like the light color lookup square dim and stuff like that. Uh, those things are all kind of hard coded in here and we kind of want to start to get those out of the, the Atlas as well. So I'm going to do this in two phases. The first phase is I'm going to get it working with using the different struct. And the second phase is I'm going to remove these values everywhere. Like I'm just going to get rid of the pound defines and have them all get pulled out of the, uh, actual struct itself as a separate thing. So in here where we have to look at the light voxel and we're pulling these elements out of here, like we're going to just do the basic thing first, which is to say, all right, this is actually the diffuse um, light atlas. And the diffuse light atlas in this case needs to uh, look out on the texels, right? And we don't actually have this as an F32. So I kind of want to do that first, which is like diffuse texels. And I'm just going to do this for now. And we're going to grab that out of here, like so, and just say diffuse texels. Uh, and then what I want to do is I want to get rid of the D, the depth value. And the reason that I want to get rid of the depth value at the moment is because, again, I really don't think we're going to need it. And hopefully, once I have the, um, once I do the light at game light atlas struct, it would be free or close to free for me to add it back in here. Because all I have to do is just, you know, access it in the same way that it's accessing the other thing and we should be okay, right? Um, so on the whole, I don't really know that I want this to actually be here uh, and doing anything. Again, like, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Uh, but, you know, my, 
my assumption is we really just don't want this. We want to just not have it because it's getting a little too real. It's trying to do a little bit too much 3D realistic lighting for us. And it's just going to slow us down without, I think, really improving the quality of the visuals of the game in a way I care about. So I'm just going to say, like, having looked at what the lighting looks like, I just don't think we're going to need that. So we can really, we can add it back in if it turns out we really, really need it. Uh, but for now, we're just going to say no. Okay. So same thing through here. Like, we're just going to have, uh, when we're actually getting these light voxels out of here, you can see us doing a bunch of stuff um, for, uh, you know, p filling in, filling in the, like, uh, the parts of the voxel that are not, uh, that's what I'm looking for. The, the parts of the voxel that are meant to handle wrapping cases. And so in this case, again, we can just really do the diffuse texel grab here and use it that, right? So this is not the full thing we want to change for these, but it's close enough at the moment. Um, that's really all we're talking about here. So again, very, very simple. Um, oh, uh, hmm. So I guess, interestingly enough, so for that, we don't actually have a way to get these as V3s. So it looks like this was voxel offset C and D. We're actually assuming that these were V3s, right? So it looks like this is actually a V3 for now. I think we probably want to change that and... But I, again, I want to do it in small passes because there's enough complexity here that I don't really want uh, to do anything uh, that could be that that I, I want to do it in small ways so I can see what breaks because it's going to be hard to debug either way, and I don't really want to be in a position where I have to debug everything at once. So I'm trying to keep the a number of changes to the smallest possible amount on each pass through the code so that I can, you know, basically verify that what I'm doing didn't break anything major each time. So that's the goal. All right, so let's see here. It looks like this is accessing the same thing each time. So I'm thinking that probably the diffuse texels should just be something that I pull out at the start. So it's probably just that. And then everybody uses it. So all throughout this whole thing, like all of these uh, commands, light voxel Cs, are all going to be diffuse texels, like so. Um, that seems sane. And then the main thing that's getting used out here looks like the only other real thing is just getting the dimensions of the voxel dim. And the interesting thing about that is you know, we looks like we don't really support uh, the, we don't support arbitrary dimensions there. Um, so this isn't really sufficient. And you can see here, like all of this stuff uh, really probably should have been done in vector, right? This should have been done in V3S to allow us to change the dimensions of our voxel if we'd wanted to. Now, it may be that that's unwise because you just waste a lot of uh, stack space or memory space sorting these dimensions and working with them or registers. Uh, you know, but I'm, I'm doubtful of that, to be completely honest. Uh, so I think it's probably more important to be able to control the dimensions of the voxel so that you can fit it better to your scenes, especially if, for example, we feel like we want a certain X, Y dimension that's fairly dense and then a Z dimension that's sparser, which is a very possible thing we might want to do, uh, especially on lower end systems where maybe we decide not to draw. Like, let's suppose we're trying to, figure out how to ship this game on a much weaker CPU and a much weaker um, GPU or something, we may want to do something where we just draw one level. Instead of, like right now, you can see down like multiple uh, floors sometimes. Like we can set our view 
we haven't really played much with that, but we could draw like several. You could look down like a hole and see multiple floors below you, for example. And if we were looking at something like that, you could say, well, we could also just use fogging there on like lower end machines. You can't really look down. And so in those cases, you'd want to be able to set like the Z dimension of your voxel to like very low, like four, even when the other two were like 32 by 32 or something. And so I feel like that's something we probably wanted to support, at least, you know. So this is not great, but, you know, oh well. So what I would probably say is like, okay, um, the hot cell count here is going to be uh, a V3S probably. So let's just do that for now. So we get that out of the diffuse light, light atlas. The large cell count for now, since that's still a constant, we can just duplicate out uh, the constant to all three channels. And then we can say, all right, when we compute the offset, well, let's just do it as a V3S. And then when we look at the hot corner, we don't actually have to convert it to a V3S because it already is. And then we have the correct um, value. Similarly, the hot dim can now become a Hadamard product, and it can become a Hadamard product with the correct actual count, like so. Um, and that's what we want here. So that's good, and that just requires moving the V3S up into a regular float V3 for doing the multiplication. Um, but again, not so bad, right? So we were sort of already prepared for this, but we just didn't actually do, oops, uh, gotta actually get the voxel dim out of there. We just actually weren't doing quite the right thing. So I think we didn't ever define an operator uh, for, like specifically for the V3Ss. I don't think we defined an operator um, for that, uh, for the, uh, you know, dividing. We probably just had a, a multiply. And so uh, I don't really know where we put our V3Ss in here. Uh, there's a lot of functions in here. One of the things I never implemented in my four coder custom layer was jumping to operators by what types they were using. It would be a nice thing just for this one case, like for math. It'd be nice to be able to say like, show me the operators for V3S or whatever, right? It's be a nice feature, but I just never got around to it. And you rarely actually need it, so it never made it up the priority list, but it, you know, in a fairly complete system, you would like want that, so you don't have to do what I'm doing here. Um, so here are the V3S operators. You can see like we've got minus and plus, but there's actually no times and divide, which you know I think we do want just for um, you know just for doing like basic you know U32s or uh, S32s. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So we basically do like all right, uh, give me the divide, give me the multiply. And in this case, they're just going to be like that, right? It's just going to be a multiply uh, or a divide. So in this case, we just, you know, implement the the basic operations for int and because those are pretty safe and we know we might want to do them for situations like, you know, like this. All right. Uh, so taking a look here, you can see we're trying to produce the dimension of this thing and we're taking the solution voxel dim and multiplying by the large cell count. And you can see that this doesn't really make any sense because now this is a, uh, this is actually a vector. So it's a vector times vector, which means this is actually a Hadamard product as well, uh, which is again, fine. Like that's not an issue because we can just multiply through dimensions by dimensions and everyone's happy. So that's the conversion. And the only problem that we have right now is if we actually ran this, we would crash pretty hard uh, and hopefully you can predict where. So we don't actually, this is the reason it's crashing here is because the first place that we write to the light buffer. The reason for that is in our OpenGL layer, uh, you notice like what I did is I replaced an actual flat array like this with just this diffuse light atlas, right? This is not getting used anymore. And so as a result, it doesn't actually point to anything. It just has like a null pointer in there that points to nothing, which is not particularly useful. So at the very least, it needs to point to this uh, and we can go ahead and, and make that happen. So if I go in here to the diffuse light atlas 
and uh, where that information is actually being set up. So you can see in here, right, uh, this is in the OpenGL begin frame. So we're doing that straight copy. This needs to actually have valid data in it. So if I were to go to, you know, like uh, OpenGL init, which I don't actually know where it is. Here it is. Uh, when we do open gel init, like what I would want to do is make sure that our, our light texture is actually set up. So in here where we have the diffuse light atlas, I would want to make sure, oops, I would want to make sure that we actually initialize all the values of it. So like <clears throat> the voxel dim has to be initialized to a V3S, the tile dim has to be initialized. Uh, and then the texels have to be initialized as well. And in this case, we'll just initialize the texels to this for now, like to the hard-coded array that we put in there. In the future, we can get a little more fancy with that if we want to. Uh, and then we can just say, look, we've got the square dim here, and we've got the voxel dim here, like so. Uh, and off we go. So, oops. There we go. So we can define that light atlas now, which is always a fun thing for everyone to do. Uh, and we now just want to make sure that the texels point to something that's big enough to hold them. Uh, and I believe they're F32s right now as the pointer. Uh, and off we go. So that's a start. So we've kind of barely sort of maybe a little bit worked towards that. And again, now I just want to run things and make sure that nothing obvious changed because I wanted this to run basically the exact same way that it was. I don't want to see any differences here, and I, and I don't really. That looks like about the same to me uh, as it was looking before, more or less. Like, no big change, right? <clears throat> okay. So now what I might want to do is the Light Atlas is itself, like I may want that to be its own file like that just has a bunch of stuff in it for working with Light Atlases. I'm not 100% certain I want to do that. It's hard. It's a hard decision at the moment, uh, but it may be something I want to do. So I may want to start moving that stuff over. Uh, so I think I'm going to create a file for this and I'm going to use that file uh, throughout. Uh, so, you know, um, something like this. So in handmade code, uh, handmade light atlas, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and I'll make an H file here and I'm just gonna put the light atlas over there. And maybe I won't call it game uh, light atlas at that point uh, because it's sort of like more of a fundamental type. I don't know. <clears throat> so I'm gonna put that in here and I'm gonna say, all right, there's a thing called the light atlas like so. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say that everyone has to use that. So if we look at where like this stuff gets um, included as well, so if I do a search for like light atlas, oh, not light atlas, math handmade math.h, um, then when we look at where that's actually happening, you can see <clears throat> that a bunch of different people kind of need access to that and that's fine. So what we may do is just go ahead and say, all right, we're gonna put that into the various places that need it. So, you know, we'd basically say like, okay, oh, well, what's in handmade shared also? Not much. All right, so inside uh, like the various places that we might need this, I'll go ahead and, and put them in there. <clears throat> uh, so handmade.h, oops. Oops, there we go. Um, and then we also need uh, the OpenGL system. So right here, we'll need that. And again, I'm not really doing this for any reason other than my own personal organization. Uh, this is not like any kind of a, like, you know, it doesn't change like what code is produced. It's not something that's like some kind of magical, uh, <clears throat> it's not any kind of like magical thing that, uh, you know, you must divide your files this way or anything like that. People get very dogmatic about the sort of thing and, and that's usually wrong. 
you just want to organize your files so that you can keep things together that you want to look at together. And that's really most of what needs to happen, right? Um, I think I put that in the wrong place. That's what I wanted. There. So now I think everyone's got it who needs it. <clears throat> and uh, now I can go over to the Light Atlas side of things and I can start putting things in here uh, that help. And so when we're in the, uh, the renderer initializing it, which was this, what I'd like to do is maybe just make uh, a thing that we use for initializing. I don't actually know where we, like how we, how we do our memory policy stuff in here <clears throat> is kind of a little bit uh, wonky. Like the render at the moment doesn't really do a lot of allocation of that uh, format. Uh, it's not really something that happens very frequently in here. So like who, who allocates the OpenGL uh, is, is a little bit uh, squinky, right? And I'm not really sure, so, so, you know, in terms of how that gets done, I believe it's in here. So you can kind of see like, all right, when we get in here, we do a win through to init open GL and you can see that that code happens here. And you can see that it's got like a win32 render alloc call and the win32 render alloc call is like a special purpose thing uh, that we use to allocate stuff. Um, I'm not actually sure, oops. Yeah, you can kind of see uh, you can kind of see it in here where it just does a virtual out directly. So I don't really want to push memory allocation through the renderer in any particular way here. And, you know, so I want this to be something that it can actually push down because it also might want to get memory that's specifically pinned for graphics card access or stuff like that, right? So it's pretty tricky to say. So I think what I want to do here is say something like, all right, there's going to be a call that's like init light atlas. Um, and init light atlas will just say like, or, you know, like this. Um, and then you would basically just pass in the things that you actually wanted to use to initialize it, right? And what I'd like to do here is make it easy for people to use. So actually, I think I might take a void there. And what I might say is like um, that maybe there's a pound define called like uh, light atlas size or something like this, or like compute light atlas size. Uh, and that would take, you know, the parameters that were necessary uh, to figure out what the light atlas size actually was. Right. Um, so I would like something like that. The problem is right now, you know, I don't know, I, I kind of want to have that allocation work a little bit differently. Like I would like it to allocate the space in some more sane way, maybe even with a buffer, with buff backing buffers or something like that. So it's a little bit hard to say what should happen there. Um, so I think what we maybe want to do is something more like this. Uh... Maybe like this. So people can kind of call these on the light atlas and sort of set things in waves. I'm not sure how exactly, like I said, I want to do it, but I want it somewhat clean because this is going to vary probably over time. Uh, and we may want to put some additional stuff in here for tracking and, and who knows what, right? So we'll kind of see what happens there as we go. The only thing that I'm not sure about is I would, what I would ideally like is you make the light atlas this way, then you say like, get light atlas size. Uh, I'd like that to, to be, you know, the way you figure out how much memory this thing takes. And then you allocate that much, right? But the problem that I see here is that 
at least to maintain the current way we're doing it without a dynamic allocation, it would have to be done at compile time. And of course, because C and C++ uh, are not very good programming languages, there's no way to actually just call something at compile time, even if the types are known and the values are known. If this was JAI, you would just do this. But of course it's not. Um, so there you go. So anyway, uh, not being able to call it at compile time means we have to actually do some thinking here where we shouldn't have had to do any thinking. And that just means, you know, we would have to pass the things individually. Like we'd like to pass a V3S, but of course the preposter can't use a V3S, so that's not really on the table. And so I don't know. Maybe I want to go to dynamic allocation here. Maybe I don't. I'm thinking about it and I'm not sure which one I want. If you look at how this thing is actually allocated, uh, so if we actually go to the Win32 handmade open jail, let me look at the... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so if I want to in Win32 and in OpenGL, I could just do it. So maybe I'll just do that. So I am going to do this. I'm going to get rid of this, and we'll just have the Light Atlas stuff happen in here. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the way we do that is not particularly complicated, right? I just wanted to be able to make sure I could do an actual alloc. And the reason I'm going to do it here is because, like I said, I might want this to actually be in uh, memory that's pinned for the graphics card to use so that the transfer can happen more efficiently. I don't know how efficiently the transfer is happening right now, but I suspect that the CPU is sitting around doing a bunch of copying for no reason. And we may want to try and get rid of that in the future by using multiple buffers, pinning the buffers, and letting the graphics card transfer one while we write into a different one. That's just something you would often want to do for efficient GPU transfers. And we want to be able to do that for multiple things. So much like we have the vertex index array, bitmap array, all this stuff here, much like we might want to double buffer, triple buffer those, we might want to double buffer or triple buffer the light atlas as well. That's all I'm basically saying. So I want it to look like the same as that system and go through the same uh, place as that system. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm going to put that in here and I'm going to get it out of here. So we're not going to do it um, in the OpenGL init. We're going to pull it out and put it uh, in the actual platform side. So this goes away like so. Uh, and we come back here to where we're actually specifying the light atlas. We're gonna uh, make that happen in here. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually specify the light atlas information at startup now. So that memory could actually get pinned at startup. And so you could actually change the voxel size you know, with a runtime parameter, right? Uh, and so that's something that's also just kind of a nice side effect. <clears throat> all right, so if we set these here, uh, now what I could do is say, all right, I want to make a light atlas, um, which is this diffuse atlas here. I want to go ahead and use these parameters for it. So, you know, the that's the, uh, the voxel dim and that's the tile dim. That's just going to create the light atlas for me. I'm then going to say that I want to set the light atlas texels to be whatever the size of the thing is, um, <clears throat> like so. So just give me the size back. I'll pass that to Win32 render alloc. So that will get me a buffer for my texels. <clears throat> Uh, and then it will set it, right, like that. So we're just going to say, look, set the texels to be whatever whatever you tell me the size now should be. That is what I will allocate. Um, and now I have a diffuse atlas, right? <clears throat> All right. So now you can see that uh, we didn't really have any compilers, so that was good. But, of course, we have link errors because we haven't actually written any of these functions. Thankfully, these functions are pretty simple, right? There's not a lot to it. If we look uh, at what these should be, and I'll just go ahead and um, make these internal. They don't need to be exported to anybody. Uh, if I go through and just do the basics here, uh, make light atlas, get light atlas size, set light atlas texels, I just need to do the basic implementation of these. So here's the results. Um, the voxel dim just gets copied, the tile dim uh, just gets copied, and that's the end of it. 
the get light atlas size uh, is again pretty straightforward. It's just the light atlas in float is the thing that determines what's going on here. I'm gonna make another function that I happen to want. Uh, so in here, I'm gonna move this up just as a more primary function and I'm gonna put another one in here which is get light atlas and, and this can be a u32 because you know it's not that big. Uh, get light at get light atlas texel size. Um, which is to say how big a particular texel is, just one texel inside the atlas. Um, and if we look at that function and write things in terms of that function for any particular texel atlas, then we know that we can just put this if in here, uh, like so. So we can say, all right, whatever the light atlas is in float, um, we can just say that the result is going to be one of two things depending on whether that's set or not. So if it's in float, then we know that the size of, um, oops, sorry, that the size of one of the texels is gonna be the size of a float times three components, the red, the green, and the blue. Uh, and then otherwise, if it's not, we know that the size of the atlas is going to be just the size of one U32 because the R, G, B, and A would be packed in there. And the A channel, like we don't really know what we would put in there. Um, but I don't know that we want these to be RGB packed. We could. <clears throat> but it starts to get a little squirrely, right? Um, it becomes harder to deal with if you don't have your things packed four wide. So I'm not sure we would necessarily want to do that, but we might. Just to save the space. So it's really hard to say. Like we could also do this. And I don't know. So, <coughs> excuse me. So for the moment, I don't know. That's just where we're at. We'll see. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, that the, you know, result of get light atlas size is just going to be uh, the get light atlas texel size, like so. I'm going to ask how big each texel is, and I'm going to multiply it by the texel count. What's the texel count? Uh, well, the Texel count is just going to be the uh, Atlas Voxel Dim X times Atlas Voxel Dim Y times Atlas Voxel Dim Z. And actually, I could just call that the, the tile count, right? And then I could say, well, what's the uh, Texels per tile? I could also call this Tiles per Voxel. Uh, the Texas per tile is the uh, vox, oops, tile dim x times atlas tile dim y, right? And I don't actually know, uh, you can see we could have written area functions for these, which we may have wanted to, right? Uh, because then you just say get area on each of these, which makes more sense. I'm not sure I'm going to go that route, but you know, you can see why that might have been a better math library decision. If we were, if one were so inclined. So we know the tiles per voxel, we know the texels per tile, and so if we want to, we can then say, well, whatever the texel size is, we just multiply it by the tiles per voxel uh, and the texels per tile. In fact, let me do this in the other things. So we go kind of in order of <clears throat> smallest to largest. So Tiles per voxel times texels per tile times the, the actual size of each texel gives us the total amount of size we need for the vox, for the atlas storage, uh, and then we're done. In terms of setting the memory now, that's just going to be a simple casting function. Uh, and I don't know that we want to do it this way uh, forever, so it's, it's going to depend eventually. But it's going to look something like this if we want to keep that. I don't know that we do. I think this may want to always be a U8, no matter what. Um, in fact, I just know that it is. I just want it to be a memory pointer. So it's, it's going to be that <clears throat> forever, at least for now. All right. So uh, now we've got all of that working, but the problem is inside anyone who actually works with this, like in the renderer and stuff, we need to actually pound include that uh, um, that I I actual code, 
right? You can see in here, we're, we're not actually including it. So in here, we need uh, anything that we work with, like a light atlas needs to occur uh, in here, right? Um, this did not return the results. Other than that, I think we're good. Uh, I could also just make this happen in here. Uh, and off we go. So I think we're good. Uh, now we should be working if we didn't put any bugs in there. If we put any bugs, uh, bugs in there, well, it will crash like it just did. Uh, so that's bad. Um, I wonder what we screwed up. Probably wouldn't be an allocation problem. What did we do wrong? Oh, <laughs> I know what we did wrong. We're not pointing to it. Uh, hold on one second. So uh, in here, I need to get rid of these, right? And I uh, just need to kind of <clears throat> run through this real quick. And anywhere that we were using the light color data before, we need to use the diffuse light atlas, Texel's pointer, right? And one nice thing about this is you can see that this calculation here was actually the calculation that we needed from before. So we actually want to use the, uh, the information in here. Now you can see that this actually, because OpenGL is kind of squirrely and does submission in a weird way for these, uh, we need to tell it what the actual situation is here. So we need one more function, right? Like in here, in addition to get uh, light atlas size, we need like get light atlas texel count, right? And so we want to actually have this interim comp, like we did this calculation, we just don't ever expose it. So what we want to do is just expose it. So this right here, where we do the tiles per voxel times the texels per tile is the total number of texels. So what I want to do there is just use that instead. So now people can get this if they want to. So I can in here just now say, all right, get me the Texel count for this thing, right? And that'll be good. And then when you look here, you can see, well, we've got some other parameters that aren't necessarily the best parameters in the world that we would like to know what those should be as well, right? And I don't know what we want to do with that. At the moment, I think I'm going to ignore those and just say, well, we'll have to like, think about that a little bit more in the future. But what I could do is in here, we could actually have some kind of a, you know, like a, I don't know what I want to call it, like a decryption. So we could in here say like, all right, the light atlas here can also have a thing that's like, is float. You know, I don't know what we want to do, but I'm just going to stub that in for now. Right, And then I can also say like, oh, all right, well, in that case, I can just do something more like I did before and say like, okay, uh, if is float atlas, then do this, else do this, oops. Right, so, you know, I can produce two different versions of this thing, depending on which one I want, uh, and, and off we would go. I can also do this a slightly different way, which is set that to the component count and do this, uh, and off we go. So now we could say like, all right, the is float is just a predication and it returns like true or false. In fact, I guess I don't even need to do that. I could just do like return light atlas and float. Or better yet. Right, so now it's pretty clear and I can say like, look, is this light atlas a float? And if it is, it's that, otherwise it's gonna be an unsigned byte or something like that, right? And so now we can actually make this code path probably handle the thing correctly that we were trying to do. 
And so this starts to look pretty nice because now it's like, oh, all right, now we don't have all these constants through now along, uh, you know, just clogging up the works, right? Uh, and that seems pretty good. And I can also do like, a, you know, a get light axis, a get light atlas texels here. Um, and I'm not sure again what I'm really going to be doing. I don't really know how we're going to handle those buffers. Uh, so I'm just blinding them for the minute. And we'll pay attention to that at some point if we care about the performance of this. So I think that's mostly what we want. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me see here. Uh, there's our set. And the reason I have this as a get is we may want this to come back as a particular type of pointer eventually. I'm not sure we do, but we're just going to see what happens. What am I missing here? Uh, oh, was that actually supposed to... Mm, um, so that actually needs to be a width and a height, right? So actually, I, all, I need more, I need even more ways to query this thing uh, that will compute the right dimensions for us, right? So I need another one, which is like get light atlas width uh, and get light atlas height. Something like that, right? Um, I didn't think about that. So I need a little little bit more complicated, right? So in here, I need to do... The way you compute the width of this thing is mm, getting rid of the Z, right? So the light atlas width is going to be the voxel dim X times the voxel dim Y times the tile dim x, right? And the height is going to be the voxel dim uh, z times the tile dim y. If I'm not mistaken, that is the way we laid out the texel. And so this is actually not what you want. Um, we don't need the text account. Although, I mean, I suppose since we have it, we might as well leave it. But, you know, not actually necessary. We could also then say, like, oh, all right, like, if you want to know what the Atlas text account is, we can actually put that in terms of that, right? So we can actually say, well, the text account is the just the width. times the height. So now that computation can just happen again all in terms of the same stuff. Right? Uh, that all seems relatively straightforward and so this just has to change so this has to be like width and height. So I think that's what we want. Don't quote me on that. And so there we go. Uh, and now we have like a little like light atlas struct we can use that has some nice Swiss Army knife properties to it. And we can start to play around with that so that now we can have a second one, right? Which is kind of what we wanted to do there. So I'm going to go ahead and say that both of these should be in the actual OpenGL system just in case we want to start sending both of them down. So I'm going to say that we have a specular light atlas and a diffuse light atlas that we're going to work with, right? Um, and again, I really don't, I don't know uh, what we're planning to do I don't know what we're going to do with these long term, right? I'm just not sure, so it's fine. Uh, what I will do here is say we're going to have a diff – I'm going to go ahead and make these both get transmitted. So there's a diffuse light atlas handle and a specular light atlas handle. I'm going to go ahead and make that change as well because why not? Uh, 
Uh, and then I'm going to go through in here and say, uh, all right, we've got the diffuse light atlas handle and the specular light atlas handle. These are both going to be the same. Uh, and eventually we kind of have to fix this because, like I said, we want these to not always be in float. So we're probably going to want to change that. And at this point, I suppose in here, we actually have this value. So I think we could actually make this just do what we want it to do, right? So we could do something where we said, okay, um, this is the width and height. So we could just say like get light atlas width, get light atlas height, um, and not have these two things hard coded, I think. Uh, and so these atlases in this case, is just going to be the OpenGL diffuse light atlas. And we get rid of these. Similarly, we can say is float. And make that an unsigned byte. And I don't actually know uh, what this format would be up here, but I'm assuming we can basically do the same thing for the most part uh, and just say like, well, all right, I guess it's gonna be GL RGB like eight, right? I think, I don't know if we have one of those. <laughs> Looks like we do. Um, so anyway, yeah, I don't really know, but that's just my, this, that's my first thought uh, about what that should be. Let's take a look at the errors here. So OpenGL is not typed right there, which doesn't help. Uh, all right. So I think that's mostly what we want there. Let me go ahead and I, I kind of want to go back to that though. Um, so let me let me take a look at that. Um, what was that again? Get light atlas width. So yeah, so we really don't want, we want this to be the same. And the only difference here is that diffuse and specular are gonna get swapped for now. Uh, that could change. We may want them to be different in the future. I'm not sure. But all right, so off we go. And the light color atlas handle obviously doesn't exist anymore. So this is just going to be the like diffuse light atlas handle and the <laughs> specular light atlas handle. These are both the same as they should be. Um, This is the submission for it. And we're not submitting the specular right now, um, but we probably should. So, you know, maybe we'll just do this. For now. Um, and we'll see what happens. And this is just drawing the two of them. This is just the debug drawing. So now we have both of those, uh, the specular light atlas and the diffuse light atlas are kind of both there. Uh, looks like we've got a bug here. I'm going to look at what that message is just so we can see. Oops. Uh, invalid texture format. So we may be returning something, but oh, um, yeah. So we didn't initialize our other atlas. So that makes sense. In the Win32 OpenGL layer, when we're actually doing our render allox here, we would need to produce something for our uh, diffuse light atlas. 
And I'm going to go ahead and say that we probably want it to be basically the same. So like we're just going to say like the light at atlas voxel dim uh, and the light atlas tile dim are going to be the same here. So I'm going to say light atlas voxel dim and light atlas tile dim. Uh, and then I'm just going to do exactly the same thing for both of these for now. So now we've initialized both of them and they both should work, hopefully. All right, so now we have the two atlases here. And like I said, at the moment, we aren't actually using the specular atlas. Like nobody's actually sampling it, for starters, um, but no one's filling it in either. So even the debug pass just shows black because no one's written anything to that. Like no one's written anything to it anyway. So that's fine. Uh, and then what we can do is now we can sort of pong back over to the lighting code itself and we can start to use these atlases more directly so that hopefully we can start to sample from the, uh, the actual atlas and not the voxel anymore. So we'd like to basically use the same, like we want to use the exact same stuff. And again, the way that we would do this is we basically say, all right, the specular light atlas is the thing that we're actually updating because it's the thing we can actually write into. And the diffuse light atlas is the thing we're sampling from. So the main change we want to make, the specular light atlas that we write into um, is, the, is the part that's currently, it's the part that's being currently played by the, by the actual um, voxel. And that's the part that we want to fix. So I'm going to take some smaller steps now and say, okay, uh, let's remove some of the constants. Again, being very trepidatious here because I don't really want, am I being trepidatious? Spelled it wrong. I, maybe, um, maybe that's wrong. Uh, maybe we'll just say being cautious then. Trepidatious might be the wrong word. I want to minimize the amount of debugging work that we have to do because this is a very complicated system. And what we're basically doing is we're sort of cleaning up code now that we see how it's supposed to work. And in that process, I don't want to introduce a lot of errors if I can avoid it. So that's why I'm trying to go slowly and do it step by step. So in order to do that, I can start to remove things now. For example, light data width, does that even get used anymore? Where is that getting used? What? Are these used? All right, hold on a second. We're gonna take this one step at a time. Like, shouldn't max light box count be the thing that's in there for the light data width? I don't know. Are these used? Are they just used for building the tree? Yeah. All right. So I want to say light data width should not be used for that. And it's actually that box count thing, this thing. For now, anyway. It's just at least a better name. All right, uh, this stuff we don't need anymore. Um, this stuff is, again, sort of redundant. Um, and the light probes are gone, so we actually can get rid of light probes entirely now and should, but I probably shouldn't do that until we're absolutely positive we don't need them. There's like an entire system that we made to track light probes so we could try them out. We just don't need them anymore. So like this nonsense here, we can just remove. And this was a ton of garbage. So assuming I can get this, again, this is one of the reasons. So like this, you know, the remove indices nonsense 
like this crap, one of the really important things that I've been trying to do throughout this whole process in the back of my head was if we can avoid using light probe locations as an actual first class citizen, I totally wanted to do it. And the reason for that is that I don't want to have to track them over time. And so we already, I think, have guaranteed that that won't have to occur. So at the very least, I can get rid of the indexes, uh, which is really good. Like, I really want this light, this tracking to go away. We don't want it. Um, so that's really good because it saves us a bunch of time in other code. Right? So I'm hoping that that's the, the case and it seems overwhelmingly the case. The other thing is, can we get rid of the light probes ent entirely? Because they're just taking up they're clogging up our entity stream for no reason. They're just extra processing we have to do every frame for no reason. And so that would also be a win. And I think we're gonna be able to get that too. Because right now, we're not using them. We're just using voxel centers. And it seems to be working okay. So we'll see. All right. Moving on. Um. Let's see what we've got here. So what is max light depth? Who uses this and why? All right, so that was only when we were tracking depths. We're not gonna do that right now. So we can get rid of that. Um, So these are now the parameters that we're actually starting to look at, and these are set inside the tile stuff. So the light lookup voxel dim uh, and the, like the, the square dim, that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, it looks like... It looks like all of this stuff um, is now kind of in the right zone. This is what we're looking at, right? Um, all right. So some of this stuff we can probably, th th this stuff I think we need to keep around in the sense that we do need to make buffers that store like our, our cluder stuff, but I'm not sure how we want to do that in the future. We may just push them on to the push buffer and not care about it. Um, and link them up that way, I'm not sure. So we'll have to see about that part. Uh, it's not super important at the moment. When we actually look at some of this stuff, now we can start to move this away. Uh, the other thing I would mention is like this light floor value, I feel like while I'm in here and looking at this code, I don't think we're actually using that um, and we should be. So in the ZBIAS program, we use a light floor now. Uh, and in fact, you can see that it's getting the light floor value is actually in there, right? So I think in the light floor value code, uh, we should be using it and we're not. So the place that that would be getting used, right, is inside sample lighting. Um, you can see in here we produce the light result and here's the sum. You can see here we do a minus and we've got the 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, right? Um, so I think what we wanna do is actually make that be something that gets passed down. And that way people can reason about it everywhere and it's not a magic constant that's sitting inside the shader, uh, which is not great. Right? So again, hopefully that doesn't affect things at all. Um, it should look the same as it did before. Uh, but again, just want to check. All right. So now let's start to peel these away. So if we look at these, we don't need the depth one anymore. We just need the color one. And I'm going to go ahead and now try try to Put that into the OpenGL layer where this thing is initialized. So in here, um, I'm just gonna define this like literally, we're just gonna do this, where I make it a U32 local, and then use it right here, right? Uh, so we're gonna try that. And then everywhere that's being it's being used, you can see all this usage of it, right? We're gonna try to make those things now work with the Light Atlas directly rather than using the magic constant. So in here, um, we have this depth lookup square dim and the light color lookup square dim. 
So these two values are not really what we want anymore. We want something more like, you know, diffuse light square and specular something like that, right? So we want the diffuse and specular tile sizes to be placed in here. And so those are going to come from, you know, the diffuse atlas and the specular atlas. And what we need to do here is, at the moment, we have to assume they're square because we don't actually allow anything else, right? So at the moment, we're just going to say, all right, the tile dim x, tile dim y, like so. And if I did that, I'm a little bit worried that's a bit landminey. So if we then change to rectangles, we'd be in trouble. So what I'd like to do there is maybe say, like, okay, let's, well, you know what? I could just start supporting it. Maybe. I was gonna do something else, but I'm like, why not just support it? So we'll pass it down and now it's got it, right? So now if I look at the actual code uh, that's using that, where we're, it's in the octahedral sample, so sampler, so you can see it here. You can see the light lookup square dim, uh, light lookup voxel dim, right? Square dim. So what I want to do is when we're doing the dim C and the dim D, uh, we kind of need those to be changed here. So we need one for the diffuse and one for the specular. And what I could do is start saying, look, maybe diffuse and specular always have to be sampled on the same resolution. I don't know. The reason I'm apprehensive about that, and so you, know, you can see why that's good because, hey, that would reduce the number of computations that you have to do here. But the reason I'm a little apprehensive about that is if you think about what you want specular maps probably want to be higher resolution than diffuse maps. So if we really wanted to pursue this a little bit further, we probably would want to be able to do a bigger specular map than the diffuse map because the specular map is supposed to show you some kind of glossy reflection, whereas the diffuse map is just a general incoming light. And so there's a big difference between those two things, and we may not want them to be the same d dimensions, right? We may be able to reduce the dimension of our diffuse map um, relative to our specular map. So looking through here where we look at, you know, what we have to work with, you can see here, these are not dependent on it. So the exterior UV dims and stuff, that's not important. Um, so really, we're just looking at, at these computations here. Moving down, you can see that it doesn't get used anywhere else either. So we're really just talking about two basic things. Um, and the samples uh, are going to be based on those. So you can see here that none of this cares about it either. So we're really just talking about the interior dims. Uh, and that's what we have to work with. So I'm going to make this one the diffuse and this one the specular. Like so. Uh, and then I want to use those separately to produce the samples. So the diffuse and specular. And then when we come through here, uh, we have different ways of, of sampling these. This one was the blurred version. Uh, and I'm not sure, if you look at what's happening, you can see the, the light color sample uh, and how it's being blurred. Again, I'm not sure how we want to do this one way or the other. Um, hmm. So there's a lot of different ways we could do this, and I'm not sure which way we want to do it. If you look at the path here, this is the simpler path. Uh, and I think what we probably would want to do, if anything, is move this to a function. So I think what I probably want to do is move that to a function. I just don't want to do that quite yet because we're trying to do this in a, in a more organized fashion. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, these, and I'm just going to throw the specular away, but I want to compute it anyway. So that's why that's still there like so. Uh, and then the rest of this stuff 
can happen as it was happening before. So sample diffuse and sample specular here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, try and uh, make those work properly. So you can see the sample CUV gets multiplied through here. It's going to be sample diffuse UV, and then it's going to do its thing. Uh, same would be for here. And then for the texture uh, results here, we would sample the other texture, right, like for the specular amount. Um, and again, like, we're just not going to do that right now. So that's going to be like, we're just going to delete that, right? So the result A is not a thing. It's just going to be like zero or whatever. All right. So if we then come through and say, all right, we need to actually make these compute the correct thing. We know that this now is, these two things were defined differently for specular and diffuse. So look up in here, we've got diffuse tile dim and specular tile dim. So the first one's going to be diffuse tile dim everywhere. Like so. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, and what you can see here is this is a little bit off, um, just if you look at what's happening. So it's taking the like, like here, let me, let me just show you what that was again. It's a little bit hard to read because it's very hard to read these inside four coder doesn't really handle having uh, stuff indented inside here docs. So if we take a look at the OctMap interior diffuse dim, right, what we're saying is, all right, so it's the amount we want to actually use of this thing. So we're going to take the x dimension. Oops. And then we want to divide it by the square of the light lookup voxel dim. So <coughs> I didn't mean to replace that, right? Because that's how many tiles counted there are across. And then we're going to multiply that by the... Um, this is, just, this is just producing the width, right, of this thing. So the diffuse tile x ends up being uh, placed in there, right? And then we have in here the same thing, but we want to do it for y. So this is diffuse tile dim y. And then this is diffuse tile dim y, like so. And then now here we're doing the exact same thing. All we need to do is just use the specular versions. So this is going to be specular tile dim x, specular tile dim x, and then here we have, oops, specular tile dim y. Oops. Right? Um, and that's what we're looking at. So hopefully now this thing is, you know, compliant with whatever arbitrary garbage we happen to pass down. And the only thing it doesn't do yet is handle the light voxel differences, right? So these are just doing like squares and, you know, it's not multiplying out the proper pieces of those, but that's okay because we're not trying to fix that yet. So then we get to light voxel. This one can just use, um, well, so the problem here is now we actually have a place where it's trying to use this to define something. So I believe this is going to have to start going away. So the voxel cell itself is going to have to start going away. Um, and we're going to have to do something about that. So when we look at like the diffuse weight map that we're computing in the light voxel cell, these have to be dependent on those numbers. And so we're going to have to make those adapt to whatever they actually need to be, right? And that's not so bad, uh, but it does create a little bit of work for us, right? So what we'd want to do here is say, uh, well, actually, let me let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and fix some other stuff first. So let's suppose we just made these arbitrary values here. Uh, 
Uh, and I'm just doing that to nerf it just really briefly so I can look at the rest of these, right? And you can see like we've got a lot of, yeah, we've got a lot of issues where things are dependent on those values being constants, which I don't know that we want, right? All right. Uh, so looking it up here, a lot of this stuff, so yeah, you can kind of see, I mean, I guess what I'm learning here is one problem we're going to have is that this information kind of wants to be baked, right? So because I can easily route this properly, so I can easily route it so that we get the information we need and use it in a computation here. When you do direction from TXY, you just pass the light atlas and then it would use the dimension. Uh, the problem with that is I'm concerned that that's going to lead to a lot more computation that doesn't need to happen. Because if these things are constant, then the compiler can fold those constants into pre-computed values, whereas if they're dynamic values, it can't, right? And so I am kind of nervous about that uh, prospect. So that tells me some pretty important information, right? And I don't know, like it's hard to say uh, to what extent that would really be an issue, you know, just looking at it here. Um, certainly in the f case of the for loops, probably wouldn't be an issue. Um, but I am a little bit worried about those direction calls. So here's, I think, what I want to do. I'm going to look <clears throat> and see how rough it is to pre-compute these values in the first place. So if I take a look at what's going on here, it looks like what I would just need is some way of pre-inverting this, right? And that seems pretty easy. So really, this OXY here is a Hadamard product with the particular light uh, atlas in question. So I think what I could probably do is say, all right, like, look, if we just say that the light atlas itself, when you define it, starts to have some dependent values that you can use as constants. So this one right here would be like the, you know, the OXY coefficient, right? Let's say. And in that case, what you could do is you could just say, look, whatever the OXY coefficient is for this thing, uh, and maybe we do it this way. So you're supposed to pass an OXY coefficient down to this thing, and then the OXY coefficient is just multiplied on here, and it's the inverse of these values. So then when you do make light atlas, um, and now you can see why I had this calls, because I kind of was a little bit, you know, in the assumption having had a lot of experience programming that we're gonna have to compute a bunch of dependent values and it turns out we do. Um, we know that we kind of do this procedure to get them. Right, so now we can just say like, okay, so whatever we compute the tile dim of this thing to be, we can compute what we need for the dependent variables just based off of that and then once that's stored the light atlas itself can provide the value here and hey guess what it's even a little bit faster potentially because we're not doing a divide right although we don't actually know that that was costing us anything divides go on a separate pipe in there unless they're dependent it's not that big a deal but it's yeah, ignore that for now so if we actually produce 
uh, that coefficient, then that's actually pretty much free, right? So then if we looked at where that was actually happening, I don't care about that, um, or that. So in here, we would just need to know that like whatever the light atlas was that we were trying to um, operate on, this would give us that information. And so in here, where we're doing the test sphere, right, and we're looping through this thing, we're trying to write into the specular map. So we would just say like, oh, okay, like whatever the specular map actually is, and in this case, we don't uh, have that here. So we, we want that to be passed in probably to the test sphere code, I'm guessing. Um, so we probably want like light atlas star, in this case, spec atlas. So in here, we would just say like, whatever the OXY coefficient is, that's what we're gonna use. And we'll just pass that in, right? So that seems like a pretty reasonable solution to that problem to me. Um, so the same thing would happen here inside get octahedral offset. I just wanna look to see to what extent we can fold these things in. Looking at this, it looks like we just need a light look up dim minus three as a constant, which again, we can just load in, right? So this is just our like, um, like our oct dim coefficient, right? Uh, and I don't know what we want to call this really. It's not particularly well defined what that would actually be. Uh, in fact, it's really wrong because this is supposed to be for a square and we're doing it the same in both. So I think we actually want this to be a V2, right? Which would be both of these two things packed together. So if you look at, it's actually this value right here. So we'd actually do, you know, we, we could actually do this. We could just say like octim coefficient here. And the octim coefficient would literally just be these two values, right? So it would be, well, I can't do it that way, but get the idea. It would be the tile dim minus three in each direction, like so. Uh, and then the oxy coefficient is just the inverse of that. Right? So once we have both of those, this becomes pretty straightforward, right? So this value now, this is just a Hadamard between the octim coefficient and the UV. Now it properly handles rectangles, which is good. <clears throat> and I think off we go, right? Uh, I think. Do I not have, uh, what's the, what is it complaining about here? So it looks like this doesn't like one over. So do we really not have that? Looks like we don't. I guess we don't have a good way to invert a vector. We probably do. probably just have what we, we probably named them so we would know what it does if it's zero or something like that is what I would guess. But it's been a while. Maybe it could have been called like one over or inverse or something like that. Or not. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm okay with doing it the old-fashioned way. All right. So now wherever we're getting the octahedral offset, again, we kind of need to know what we're sampling from. In, case of, in the case of the compute voxel irradiance at, uh, in this case, we're going to have to pass down... Uh, the light atlas, and this one's going to be the diffuse atlas, right? So in this case, we just need the diffuse atlas 
octadim coefficient. And then actually, you know, this, this is what we're going to replace. So this lookup voxel clamped is actually going to be something that we use the diffuse atlas for, and we're going to stop using the cells for it, but that's a separate issue. Um, so same th is true here. So here we are in the test cast. This is going to have to take the light atlas. Um, this is the spec atlas, I guess. In this case, So, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. So then we get to the places where we're actually looping over things. And in this case, you can kind of say, well, all right, we can just look these up in the thing we're looping over. So whatever we're planning to write out to, which in this case would be the spec atlas, that's what we're looping over. So this is just the spec atlas tile dim y uh, and the spec atlas tiled in x, right? Uh, and those are just basic light loops. We're getting rid of the, d the, the d there, so that's going away. Um, I think we're good there. For compute voxel irradiance at, in this case, like I said, we need to start passing these down. So we've got the light atlas here, um, and this is gonna be the spec atlas and the diffuse atlas. We're going to use both of them in this case. Don't ask me why I put them in the wrong order. I don't know. Uh, and then when people actually need to use them, we need to pass the right one. Uh, so whichever one it is that we actually want to use has to be passed here. I don't actually know. You know, this may be a mistake using the address of this thing. Uh, we may actually want to do just copying it in wholesale. Uh, so we may want this thing to actually look like this, right? Because we don't want, um, and again, <clears throat> there's no point to this other than to tell the compiler, hey, look, like we aren't aliasing. So when we write out to things, you don't have to worry about that. It's a little bit premature to do that. So I'm just not going to do it yet. When we actually look at the performance of this thing, we'll have to look at the code and see what the compiler is doing to know whether we care uh, about that. Now, what is the problem? Specular light atlas, is it not? Did we call it spec light atlas? What did I call it? Or is it not in here? All right. So apparently we never actually copied that thing, which was a mistake. I guess I just never went back to the open jill in it um, and actually placed it in there, uh, which is weird, but I guess that's what happened. So wait, but we would have to, how is that possible? Cause we allocated it, didn't we? Like, uh, when, oh, it, never mind. That's just where we set it in for each frame. Uh, so yeah, I'm assuming that in here, we just need to copy this forward. So specular light atlas like so. And off we go. Okay. So when we're doing compute voxel irradiance and we need to sample this, we need to sample the diffuse atlas in that. So we're going to pass the diffuse, at, at, diffuse atlas to that. Uh, when we're updating this voxel here, so oct offset when it gets passed to update voxel, that's the spec atlas here. So for the spec atlas, we need to pull out um, the octim coefficient, right? Uh, for the get octahedral offset call. In here where we're doing the Q callbacks for the oct C dim and the oct D dim, uh, again, these are really, so what's happening now is this is the part where we need to do like the updates to things. So at this point, we need to start replacing these calls themselves, but again, we're making so many changes here and we're gonna have to, this one's gonna require debugging because remember we have to change the actual voxel writing part of things. So that's, it's gonna be a nightmare. It'll probably take into tomorrow to do. Uh, anyway, so we wanna try and keep this at a minimum. 
So at the moment, what we probably want to do here for the oxydim and the octidim, well, I don't know. I guess they're only being used in uh, just in here. So I guess not. So I guess that's okay. So we're going to pull that out. And we're going to take these, which are the accessors, and we're going to move those into here, right? So whenever you're trying to get stuff, you're going to ask this, this code for it in the future. And we're going to work our way towards that. All right, so let's see where we're at. In here where we're doing our casting, again, we probably want to pull out the atlases so we just have those around. So we're going to have those here. And then we're going to have to look at what we're actually doing. So if we take a look, when we do our like test casting, um, I'm not sure why this didn't complain. Oh, because we're doing full cast. If we were doing test sphere or test cast, uh, we would have had to pass down the atlases here, I believe. Like if we look at test cast, um, it wants the spec atlas. Oops. Uh, so let's go ahead and pass that. Um, I'm assuming test sphere does as well. Um, so that's spec atlas there. Uh, so those two can stay the way they are. And then full cast grabs them out of the work anyway, so we don't really need to look at that. So then we come to here, and this is where we actually do like our blurring and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then we do our edge fill. So if we have the blurring and the edge fill that needs to happen, uh, then we look at what's going on here. We need to do a couple different things. So first of all, when we look at the blurring function, the blurring function is reading from the spec map uh, and writing into the uh, diffuse map. And like I said, the way that we want to do that is going to probably change over time, and especially if we end up having a spec map that's a different resolution. So we're probably going to have to revisit this routine. For the minute, I will just, put, I will just make it work exactly the way that it should. Uh, I'll make it work exactly the way you would expect if it was going to just continue to be the same dimensions. And we'll sort of try to address it more later. So if we take a look at what's going to happen here, we effectively need to loop over the rows of the diffuse map and the columns of the diffuse map writing into the diffuse map. So this value here is just going to be whatever the um, interior edge dimensions basically are of this thing. So this is just going to be the tile dim x. Uh, so is this. I'm sorry, y. And there's x. Uh, and then inside here where we're looking uh, at what the sampling is going to be, the sampling obviously is going to be over the specular map. So instead of sampling over the... Um, Instead of sampling over the diffuse atlas's dimension, we would want to sample, because that's what we're writing out to, we would want to sample over the spec atlas's dimension, right? Like so. And then the main problem we're going to have, again, is that how we're computing these diffuse weight maps. Uh, that is going to have to change because it's not dynamic at the moment. So then the primary thing we need here is we need the ability to get these voxel offsets, like where in the map we're looking, right? And in order to do that, we need to produce uh, this voxel offset C values, right? Um, and we need to be able to produce those reliably. Now, we don't need the D because we're not writing into the D at the moment. Um, but what we do need to be able to do, you can see kind of here, when we access the diffuse map itself, we need to pull from the spec map and write to the diffuse map. So this is actually not going to be diffuse texels anymore. It's actually going to be um, spec texels, if that makes sense. Um, so so uh, I, I shouldn't say it that way. So the cell that we pull out, right? like this part of things, that's the thing, you know, this part is the part that's now going to have to change to be pulling out of the spec map. So this can stay the same because it's the right part that's writing out, but this part's going to have to be fixed, right? Uh, okay, so that's fine. That's what we would, uh, you know, that's what we'd expect. It's totally fine. 
So in order to do that, I think there's a couple things we probably want to be able to do at this point. So now we probably want to be able to do some strided offsets into these things. Because you look at how we want to actually uh, access this thing, right? We're going to want to pull from the cells more reliably by actually using um, some pre-baked offsets for where we're writing into these things. So that whole process is probably going to have to change a little bit. Um, I'm going to push forward slightly just really quickly. Uh, just to see what we have to do here. So looking at it, I'm not sure what the n value is supposed to be here. That was just uh, us trying to look at what the tx should range to. So when we're actually copying those uh, from one side to the other and we're doing our plus n, so the n here is actually the x dimension, right? So what we want to do, I guess, is set the end depending on the situation. Um, we probably want to do something more like this. And this whole thing itself, we're going to have to run once for the spec map and once for the diffuse map, right? So we're going to want to do uh, these two maps actually differently, right? We're going to want to blend these both. And so this process itself, I think, is probably going to want to be pulled out into a function that's like the edge duplication function. You know what I'm saying? So we probably want something like this. Like that. Uh, or you know, fill border, something like that. And it would take a light atlas and just do it. Because I don't think there's anything else special about it. So this code right here that actually, you know, does all this nonsense, right? That code is something we can do on an atlas. And we might want to do it on both atlases. I don't know, but let's suppose that we do. And so what we wanted to be able to do here is say, okay, after the diffuse down sample, uh, or possibly before the diffuse down sample, we want to go ahead and fill the spec map border. So we do the spec atlas fill here. Um, and then after we finish the sampling, uh, the down sampling, which again, like I said, well, you know, now that I think about it, that doesn't really make any sense. We don't, this is not going to pull from those values, so it doesn't matter. So it's really just this. Right, so we want to be able to do both of those, and we can um, by using fill atlas, right? <clears throat> and so now this code just has to be able to work uh, using the uh, the atlas only, and I think it can, right? This is just the tile dim x here, and then we do the tile dim y here, uh, and I think all of this code works roughly the same as it should. Um, with no real, uh, with nothing else really problematic in it. So then we have to just do uh, this voxel offset nonsense, just needs to be changed slightly. So all we really have to do is just light atlas offset. Um, well, so I'm replacing voxel offset C, right? Actually, let me do this even better. So I'm gonna replace voxel offset C parentheses with light atlas offset parentheses atlas comma space. And that will do what I want, which is to use a different offset here. Now this code wants to be optimized to not use so many offset calls. Um, that's a separate issue that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but basically, other than that, you know, we're okay. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. So anyway, looking at the Light Atlas code where we have this stuff, we don't need two of these now. All we really need is the fact that this is a Light Atlas offset um, and that you pass an atlas should give you all the information that you actually need. 
So now in here, we just need to fill in these dimensions with the correct dimensions that you're actually trying to pull from. And off we go. So, you know, we'd want to say something like this. Like all of these are going to be off of the atlas, right? Like so, and all of them are going to want to be the correct thing. So if you take a look here, the like uh, the hot dim in this case is talking about the voxel dim, and is talking about the voxel dim x, voxel dim y, because it's the z sheet. This is talking about the tile dim x and the tile dim y, because that's the size of one of those tiles. Then we're talking about, in here, for a Y sheet, uh, that's actually gonna be uh, the X, I guess, is how much you'd be going. Um, let me just make sure I've got all of this in here. This is a pretty complicated uh, thing. So if you take a look at X times, obviously X is gonna have to go by tile dim X's, right? So that one's easy. Uh, y is going to have to go by tile dim x's as well, right? And it's going to have to go by voxel dim x of those. The text y is actually going to have to go a whole row down. So that's actually going to be the tile dim x times the tile dim y. Um, times, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Voxel dim x times the voxel dim y. Uh, and then finally times the tile dim x, right? So I think that's the correct like code for an atlas offset. And so finally in here, uh, where we're looking at a particular, where we're filling in a light atlas border, um, in this case, we need to tell it which of the ones we were looking at, right? And that's just a straight pass through. Yeah. So I think that's all we really need. There we go. All right. Um, no, that's wrong. OK. Uh, so that should do it. And I don't know why I keep typing time dim. No real reason. Uh, so then when we get down to actually filling these, we just need to pass which one we're filling which is pretty simple. And then when we're working with these things here, any other place we use light atlas offset, we just have to talk about which one we're actually using. So in this case, it's the diffuse atlas. And off we go. So for the rest of this stuff, now we get into the nasty part of things. Uh, let me go ahead and also just in here uh, for building the direction out of what we're looping over. Um, in this case, Excuse me. Uh, in this case, we're trying to talk about the incoming direction. And so the incoming direction, so you can see each of these, they're going to be different light atlases. So this one for the outgoing, that's going to be the diffuse atlas. Uh, and that's going to be its, uh, what did we call this? It was the OXY coefficient. <clears throat> like so. And so in this case, we just need to compute this value and it needs to be computed uh, based on those two things. So we need the diffuse atlas 
and the spec atlas to be passed in. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then when we actually prepare these, uh, we can do the same thing. So in this case, we can say like the diffuse atlas tile dim y uh, and the diffuse atlas tile dim x. And then in this case, it's the spec atlas tile dim y and the spec atlas tile dim x. Uh, and then I think that's, that's everything, right? <clears throat> So the problem that we then run into, obviously, is we have sort of this issue where we don't actually know how big these things are going to be. So we have no idea what we should actually be doing here. And if you assumed that we were able to change these at runtime, which you know at the moment we don't actually allow you to do, but if you could, you could see where we'd be in big trouble because we don't actually have a way of, of coping with that, right? Uh, so I guess what I would say is the only thing I can really think of is we can either compute it every time it changes, right? Um, and uh, that seems sane. I'm trying to think of what else we could do. I mean, I really can't think of anything else we could really do there. So, I mean, I don't know what else, I don't know what else to do there other than, yeah, like just um, compute it any, any time it changes or something like that. And for the moment, we don't really have to care, right? Um, because it will do the right thing in this case. But, so like, you know, in begin lighting computation, for example, we could compute it if it had changed, um, if those dimensions had changed, or just every frame if we're just being sloppy because it really won't amount to much compared to the rest of the stuff we have to do. Um, it's not that bad, right? Uh, but we do want to figure it out. So I'm not sure exactly what I want to do there, right? Like, I don't know. Um, it's tough to say. For now, we're going to do it here. And then we'll take a look at it later. So, get light atlas texels. So it looks like we didn't include the C file, which I guess makes sense. I may have not put the actual, <clears throat> excuse me. I may have not put the actual C file in here, so we may want to go ahead and do like a handmade light atlas.cpp, like so. It doesn't really matter where we put that one. There we go. Uh, so now we are at least compiling, but this isn't actually correct. If we ran this, it would just kind of roll over and die. The reason for that is we have these light voxel cells and they're not the right, uh, none of this is the right information. You know what I mean? So uh, we're currently just kind of borked uh, a little bit. If you look at what's happening here, it kind of looks like it's still working. And you know, I guess I'm surprised it's working as well as it is. I guess we did a very good job of that port. Um, so maybe it's not as bad as I thought, but my point is it's not doing the right thing at all. So it's not actually sampling from the correct map. It's still using these light voxel cells and uh, we need to, so go ahead and, and finish that change. Since we are out of time, I'll end it there for today. Tomorrow what we'll do is we'll uh, actually go through and pull from the correct maps. So we'll get rid of using the light voxel cell. Uh, and that'll be the uh, change that finally puts us in sort of a nice streamlined position where everyone's using the correct map, reading and writing from the correct maps. Uh, and that's then we'll get to see like, okay, as we tune the lighting a little bit, how good can we get it? You know, what does it look like?
I'm encouraged, again, by how good this one looks using just specular. <clears throat> it's not great. It needs some work, but it's better than I would have expected, right? So, you know, um, it's at least encouraging. Uh, but but we don't know how good it's going to be till we actually play around a little bit more. Let's go ahead and go to Q and A. The heck? Oh, the control key is held down. There we go. <clears throat> oh, so I can answer the question about VC runtime before I do that. Uh, so no, we don't use any DLLs uh, that we didn't write ourselves. We do use the sine and cosine functions from the static CRT, um, but we will replace those eventually too. But right now we don't load any non-system DLL, so we don't use VC runtime 140.dll. Uh, so like, Not sure where the depends function is here. I don't know how well these things work. Uh, Microsoft has made it almost impossible for any of this stuff to be any good, like, because they've made their runtime linking so incredibly janky that even just analyzing something to find out what it depends on is incredibly hard. That's how bad Windows is these days. It's really bad. This is why you should never use any of the new stuff like manifests or side-by-side -side assemblies or any of that. It's just a disaster. Really, really bad. Um, they've done a terrible job. They should have stuck with the original DLL system. For uh, the faults that it actually has, uh, it's still way better than uh, what they replaced it with. So here's Win32 Handmade, and you can see what the import libraries are. Uh, and you can see it, you know, it's just GDI, kernel, uh, user and WinMM. So it's only just the system libraries we need to call. This is the entirety of everything, all of our external dependencies, right? Um, and we can also look at the uh, runtime <clears throat> DLLs. So uh, if we look at like the game DLLs, like, like this, right? Uh, you can see the imports here and they're basically the same right? Uh, it's just kernel 32 and nothing else because we just you call through the platform layer. And finally, if you look at the renderer DLL, uh, that's just going to have OpenGL, right? So you can see OpenGL. And then obviously GDI kernel and user because it needs to access like the window functions. So we're pretty much, we're a third party library completely free the only thing we still use is the sine and cosine routines that were written for the, the standard library wrote. Uh, so we need to write our own of those, and then we're 100% clean. Like, literally no non-our code, period. Do you know why some games require you to restart if you change graphics settings is because they can't reload different textures at runtime? Uh, it's not usually because they can't reload textures at runtime, although some games that may be true. It's usually just because, look, they didn't want to have to do the work of making everything uh, properly track what dependencies there are on those things. So for example, let's suppose that you know, you've got a bunch of variables that are, like we do, right? 
we have a bunch of variables that are dependent on things uh, that have to do with the graphics subsystem. And we've actually done a pretty decent job of passing those through so that you can actually change a, a fair number of them at runtime and it just works. But there are some that we probably don't. And in fact, like one of the things would be like, let's say we, we didn't want to actually have a thing that detects, like we just looked at, that diffuse uh, blur coefficient, right? That matrix. If you just didn't do the work of tracking the change on that, then you can't change it at runtime. You have to, you know, restart the game and compute it at init time, which is where it gets computed, right, or something. So usually what happens is game developers, and rightly so, don't want to bother because it's not really something you need to do. Like, people don't need to be able to change 100% of their graphics settings on the fly. So typically what they'll do is they'll say, look, we just don't want to deal with having to, to make sure all of that code is dynamically responsive and doesn't introduce bugs when you do it. So it's usually just safer for them to say, look, if you want to change any kind of core graphics setting, just restart the game. And I respect that because it's not a great place to spend your time. It requires extra engineering to clean all of those paths completely and test them. So it's just like, don't bother. Now, I totally respect people who go the extra mile and let you do it. It's great engineering to support that, but you know, it's engineering that comes at a cost because it means, it means you weren't doing something else. Why don't all studios use the dynamic DLL loading? It's the best thing ever, right? Uh, the reason is because, especially if you're like a C++ nonsense engine, where you have like all this garbage all over the place, you actually can't do it. So one of the things, the reasons that we can do it so easily is because we have relatively clean code that uses relatively clean allocation strategy. If you have a nonsense allocation strategy, all this stuff goes out the window, right? Because you've just got people calling stuff all over the place and you've got V tables everywhere and all this other stuff that can create all kinds of problems for you. And so <clears throat> C code, it's very usually very easy to take C code and make it hot reloadable. C++ code is not that way. Um, and so usually what it means is they just didn't, it's just probably too hard for them to add. Right. Did you forget to upload the previous episode of YouTube? Uh, no, we just didn't do it on Sunday. We didn't actually end up coding on Sunday. Any plans to open source the code? Uh, yeah, we pre-announced when we started the series that the code will get released in the public domain two years after the game ships. So it will be uh, released eventually, but not anytime soon. Apologies in advance if this was already answered previously, but is there a particular reason you use structs and global functions instead of classes? Um, so there's a couple of reasons. I guess uh, maybe two reasons. One is obviously the word class is meaningless, doesn't do anything in C++. Uh, it, it was, I don't even know why they have it. It's a, it was a stupid idea. A class is just a struct or equivalent. The only difference between the two is a struct starts out with a default public colon and a class starts out with a default private colon. And what's absolutely hilarious to me, it literally cracks me up every time I see it because I'm just like, do you even program, bro? Is like, I see this. <laughs> right? If you typed that, you could have just typed this. I don't know. It's like, they're just like, yeah, man, we literally just don't care. You know, I, I, it blows my mind. So anyway, like in terms of the literal word, why do I use struct instead of class? The reason is because what I'm actually defining is a thing where I want all the members to be public. And so it seems kind of stupid to type class blah, open bracket, public colon, right? But the broader question of why don't I use like classes with member functions and virtual functions and that sort of stuff, and it's just because uh, I find that to be a poor way of structuring and thinking about your program. And the reason that I say that is because um, I've always said this, the problem I think with object-oriented programming, the reason I don't like it, the reason I don't do it, is not because there's anything wrong with certain things that you might want to do, such as creating API boundaries or encapsulation or any of these sorts of things, right? Um, because every programming technique tends to have a place where it makes sense, um, and I don't want to disparage a particular technique. The problem with object-oriented programming is the phrase and the mindset. So creating a class and thinking that I put member functions in a class, that is just fundamentally incorrect way to structure a program, period, in my opinion. The reason for that is that 
I don't feel like algorithms ever operate on one thing. They operate between two things, typically. And you always want to think about that pipeline as the primary thing. And so most of your functions should be operating across structures, not within them. And if most of your functions operate within structures, you've probably screwed something up. And you're probably very inefficient, which, by the way, is how most object-oriented programming looks to me. When I look at it, I'm like, that is a very inefficient way you just wrote that. And I can see why. It's because you were thinking that things should be contained inside class boundaries. So I really, 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 really like to emphasize the fact that that's actually very bad. Now, it doesn't mean that once in a while you don't end up with something that can be completely isolated within itself. So, for example, the texture atlas thing we made today... Uh, Light Atlas, rather. This is an example of something that could have been a class if you'd wanted it to be, right? Because it happens to all be self-contained at the moment. And that may continue. But the crucial difference here, and I really want to emphasize this, is that should be the accidental case, not the goal. So the problem with object programming is they say that this is the goal. The goal is to end up with things like this. It's not. When you end up with something like this, it's usually an accident, and it's usually very inconsequential pieces of the code. This is irrelevant. Like this is not an important part of our program. It's tiny and it's meaningless. And it's basically a bunch of convenience functions to opt to compute things, right? The goal of your code should produce clean data pathways that work between multiple structs, right? And so what you really want to do is get out of that mindset of I put functions inside data structures, because functions should not be confined to data structures. That's a very, very bad way. It's flipping the actual way you should think about programming, which is that data types are things that are used by functions. Instead, you're thinking the other way around, as functions are things that are used by data types. Very, very bad mental model. So that's why I do it this way, is to you know, remind everyone and to avoid my own falling into a trap of thinking that things should be lined up in that way. Um, I managed to extract the CLXC from Visual Studio, but I can't redistribute it. Has anyone been sued for redistributing the free CL compiler? Um, so I don't know if anyone has been sued, but obviously anyone could be sued. So I guess what I would say there is it's a copyrighted program. If you distribute it, you are opening yourself up to a lawsuit by Microsoft should they choose to do that. At the very least, I would say maybe try to ask Microsoft specifically if they mind you producing a bundle of that. What is your plan to ensure the orphanage our hero lives in will have sufficient access to paper products, especially toilet paper? How will hand washing work in a world where everything is handmade but the children have no limbs? So uh, this is actually an issue, no question. And that is because limbless orphans, which is what we have in this game, would have to do everything with their mouth largely, which of course is a very bad disease vector. So I guess the way that I would say it is, it's very important that people who interact with this orphanage proper, uh, basically have very good hygiene, because otherwise they will definitely have like, you know, issues with it. Like basically you have to just make sure, you have to do like what I'm doing right now, is just like not going outside, right? Not leaving the apartment. Um, so that basically you know that you don't bring the contagion in. Because once the contagion's in, it's over. There's nothing you can do about it, right? Um, so, well, touching your face is fine if you're not in an environment that has any contagions around it, right? Just don't go outside and do that, you know? You move from an array of light voxel cells to a light atlas, that because of OpenGL atlases or other? Yes, yeah, sort of. I basically want to have one format through the whole pipeline. So before we were storing these things in the light voxel cells, and that was a convenience for us. And instead, I want to move to everything sampling out of just, just flat atlases. And that just allows us uh, to keep everything simpler, removes code types, 
keep it simpler. And also, if we need to offload this work to the GPU, we can. Because at least then all of our code is just working with the same concept the whole way, right? Is using MM load PS and MM store PS more efficient than just passing to floats or accessing it through a union? Um, I guess the answer would be, so it's a little bit complicated. The answer is it really depends on what the compiler chooses to do. So none of this matters at some level because what's actually going to happen is there's going to be um, there's going to be actual assembly language calls to move the data out of the SSE registers into memory one way or the other. And what you choose to tell the compiler to do is going to help it potentially make a good decision. But at the end of the day, you can't control what the compiler does. The compiler does what the compiler does. So if you cast a floats or access through a union or anything else, the compiler may or may not know what you're doing. And at some point, you may care about the performance of that code. And when you go look at the disassembly, you may see that the compiler has made it a bad choice. Using the intrinsics is a way of telling the compiler what you were trying to do in a cleaner way so it has a greater chance of outputting the assembly language code you actually wanted. But that's all that's happening there. And if you really want to do it right, you have to write it in assembly language anyway because that's the only way to actually control exactly what's happening. So intrinsics are just hints to the compiler about what assembly language code you are trying to generate in a way that makes it much easier for the compiler to know as opposed to if you just use like unions or stuff for convenience, which I do sometimes, but when I actually have to go to optimize something that's usually the case, the compiler doesn't really know what you were doing there and it will generate like code that's not as good or something, right? So that's really what's going on there. It has nothing to do with one or the other being better. It's more just like, look, C is not good at this. The intrinsics were a bad solution to this problem. What we really needed was language features that work with wide vectors, types like that, and we don't have them. So at this point, we're kind of screwed and we just have to use these intrinsics. And so what you're trying to do is basically tell the compiler what you're doing in a way that, that is easy for it to generate good code and not have to do all kinds of analysis that's tricky and error prone to figure out what it was you were doing. Would you be able to do, give an intuitive geometric explanation for what the adjoint matrix computes and why you need it for doing generalized transforms on surface normal vectors? I mean, yeah, and I think I already did. Um, so I want to see if you go to our search here. Oh. Um, so I don't like the sound of that. So maybe I didn't. So this is the ex yeah. So this is it right here, right? If you go to day one hundred one, this is it. Uh, and you can see me like transforming a geometric shape, and you can see how the normal doesn't transform the same way that the points transform, and that's what the adjoint is for. Uh, so this I would go here. So I don't know if we actually got to the adjoint matrix part of it. We may not have, but that's the reason. This is the explanation. We probably just never called it an adjoint matrix. So So actually, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at a linear algebra textbook. Is this just the transpose, though?
Can you just write the equation, please? All right, so where's a math person? Can someone please put the actual equation in one line? I guess it's not possible probably on uh, thing, but normally you trans you uh, normally when you transform normals, you transform normals by the inverse transpose. Do you think using OpenGL for making games is still fine for the next couple of years? I've heard John Blow rant about it not being valid API, but I'm not sure why. Um, I mean, it's not good, uh, and largely just because there's been bad shepherding on that part. Like, I think OpenGL 4.5, especially with the NVIDIA extensions, was a great API. I think someone should have standardized on that, removed all the cruft, and been like, this is the new API. Would have been way better than Vulkan. Would have been as fast as Vulkan. Um, but they didn't do that. And so the problem with OpenGL, it's just really sprawling. And so it's very unlikely to be supported properly most of the time, uh, especially on like Intel parts, stuff like that. And now it's not supported on a Mac anymore. So you can't use it there. So like Vulkan, OpenGL, kind of useless, should just get thrown away probably at this point. And I think we're basically looking at a metal D3D world, more or less. Um, <clears throat> Unless someone's shipping stuff on Linux, which game developers don't really need to do. Um, I mean, I would argue they shouldn't bother shipping on Mac either. So I think you're basically looking at Metal on iOS if you really want to go to that platform. Otherwise, it's just a D3D world now. You don't really need anything else. I mean, you're shipping on Windows. Um, or you got to write a custom thing for PS4, Xbox. So... Uh, Mac, Apple does not support current OpenGL. They do not have a compliant like 4.6 implementation. They absolutely don't. What do you think about the style of using a bunch of defiance control the generated code of an include for things like libraries? Um, I think it's fine. The only problem with it is that it can get kind of hairy and hard to maintain. But you know, if you if you deploy it judiciously, it's fine. Do you take any programming courses at college? <laughs> I didn't go to college. Taylor Tyler said on the Wikipedia page, the 2.2, the two by two generic example. This one? So the So I want to say that this is not exactly right then. Um, so I guess it's kind of hard to say, like just thinking it through. So like, if you look at what the matrix ends up being for like an inverse matrix, so here's like a two by two inverse, right? Um, and so a inverse here, you know, it equals uh, this analytic solution. So you're looking at one over AD minus BC, D negative B negative CA, right? Um, and if we look at the, 
what what they're suggesting here and i like i said this is just what it came for for adjoint matrix which is just not it says it's sometimes called adjoint so you know let's assume that this wikipedia page is accurate um if this is the actual computation for it then if you look at the two side by side i'll just explain why i'm nervous about it and like i said it's been a long time since i studied linear algebra so take it with a grain of salt i'm just telling you what it looks like to me which is not dispositive in any way um, so here's what, you know, you would expect the analytic inverse to look like, right? And here's what the adjunct, the aggregate matrix looks like, right? And that's not even remotely what I would expect it to look like. Like, what I would expect to see is for transforming the normals, I would expect to see this matrix, but with the negative B and negative C swapped. This term would remain. Here, that is gone. Um, so maybe this is not what they mean. Maybe they mean this or some, I mean, I don't know what they mean. I, I'm not sure if I'm, but I mean, if I'm reading this right, no, it's like totally not correct. Like, it's not what you would transform the normals by at all. <clears throat> so I don't know. I mean, it could be this is just the wrong Wikipedia page. Uh, but all I wanted to say was, like, what I would expect to see for transforming normals is this matrix but transposed. So, you know, a transpose of a matrix is you flip uh, along the diagonal, right? So the negative B and negative C would swap. And the same would be true for any size matrix. So if you told me I had transform uh, normals in three dimensions, right? Um, well, actually, that's not true because normals only really... Uh, you would have to go to bivectors to go above three dimensions anyway. So this, all this stuff is not the way you would even think about it at that point. But the point is, like, if you had a three by three matrix, you would do the same thing. So basically, you would take a look at uh, what you got here. So, you know, you would, you would uh, compute the 3 by 3 inverse, and then you would transpose it. So the BCF and the DGH would flip, flip sides. Make sense? <clears throat> I don't have a Raspberry Pi 4, no. Why would id support Vulkan instead of just DX? I have no idea. You'd have to ask them. Will you ship the game with debug GUI? Mike Acton said on GDC conference that you should be able to debug the release version of your game. How do you do that? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't really know what Mike Acton said about that. Uh, I mean, I guess what I would say is the release version of the game can have bugs in it that are that can't be found in, like, that don't show up in a debug build. So what I would say, and I have no idea what Mike said, but what I would say is you need to at least make sure that when you're testing your release build, that if bugs come up, you have ways of tracking them down. So you can't remove 100% of the scaffolding from your system because if you do, you won't be able to find those bugs. Now, it may be that you engineered your product so it won't have those bugs, that's possible, but whatever you do, you need to plan for that. So that's what I would say. And I don't know if that's similar to what Mike Acton said or not. All right. Oops. Just make sure we're all saved up here. Thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. Uh, if you would like to follow along the series at home, you can always pre order the game on handmadehero.org. It comes with a source code so you can play around with it at home. Uh, maybe you can finish the lighting port we did before I get to it tomorrow. It'd be good practice because it's literally just rote translation, but it's meticulous. So, you know, and it's a good code cleanup. It's making the code better 
uh, and less fragile because we're actually centralizing how a bunch of things are done. So it's a good thing to be in the habit of doing and knowing how to do. Uh, I'll be back here tomorrow morning for that. Until then, have fun programming, everyone, and I'll see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.